world, in particular about the map that gave America its name. It's this map over here. It's called the Waldsimmler map of 1507. Um, and uh, as I was writing the book, um, immersed in a period of history that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago, I kept on having the impression then that um, the people I was writing were about were a, a, sort of a direct analog to you all here. Uh, it's, it's something that I just couldn't shake. Uh, and that's because um, the, the story that I tell in the book is about a group of people who stitched together a whole number of different cartographical traditions and technologies, um, harnessed the power of some new ideas and some new technologies, um, and, and uh, in a kind of democratic, help everybody see and understand the world spirit, uh, came up with a profoundly new way of mapping and visualizing the world that is this map. Um, so in effect, uh, what they were doing and what I was trying to capture in the book was people in the act of doing this, um, namely cocking their heads, looking at the world that they've been taught to know, uh, and trying to see it, uh, understand it, imagine it, and depict it in meaningful new ways that are going to be useful to uh, all sorts of people. Uh, this is a book about maps. It's a very visual book. Uh, it's a visual story that I tell, which is why I'm going to show a lot of slides today. We're going to survey, uh, in short order, all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful old maps and diagrams that date to the period of this map and before. Um, and I'm going to try to tell you two stories, and they're the same two stories that I tell in the book. Uh, one is the relatively small but fascinating and pretty um, unknown story of how in the years immediately leading up to 1507, this one map was made, uh, this uh, map that I'll also be showing you on the screen. Um, this copy of the map over here is a full-size facsimile. It's the one that will give you a sense of what the map really looks like. Um, this is a very diminished version of it up here. So after the talk, if anybody hasn't looked at it already, please do. Uh, there's nothing like seeing it. Um, face to face. There's an original copy uh, at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. If you're ever there, I strongly encourage you to go see it. Um, this does a decent job of reproducing it, but it's not perfect. Um, this is the map that gave America its name. The makers of this map actually coined the name America. Uh, and it's also the map that, in effect, uh, launched the 500-year reign of the printed world map as we know it today. Uh, before the making of this map, uh, you really didn't have a single standard idea of what a world map was. You could mention the phrase world map to 10 different people, and they might imagine 10 radically different pictures of the world. Uh, after this map and the vision of uh, geography that it presents, you start to see the world map sort of fixing itself into place uh, and ultimately um, leading to the world as we know it today. This, it's sort of the mother of the modern world map, in a sense. Um, that, in turn, uh, leads me to the second part of the story that I tell in the book, which is not the story of this one world map, but the story of the world map uh, that we've all known for so long uh, until you all started to mess with it. Uh, um, so the bigger story that I'm trying to tell in the book is the story of how uh, Europeans and others, uh, starting about 1200, um, individually and collectively, uh, intentionally and unintentionally, um, gradually uh, expanded their horizons, traveled more around the globe, um, <clears throat> gathered together fragments of geographical information, um, and ultimately pieced them all together and uh, decided that they could imagine their way to a vision of the world as a whole for the first time, the very first time. And that's what comes together in this map. It's a presentation of the world, a full 360 degrees of longitude. Uh, it's, a, it's a real milestone. Um, so ultimately, this book uh, is a story uh, not just of maps, uh, not just of geography or exploration or adventure, although there's plenty of that in the book, but it's, it's also a story of ideas and the power of the human imagination, um, which is why it's fun, I think, and what's certainly why I had fun doing it. Uh, I thought we could just start by looking at the map and very quickly describing what it shows. Um, north is at the top. In 1507, that wasn't a, a given. You know, we, not, we like to think of north as the natural top of the map these days, but at, at this point in history, it wasn't necessarily the case. Um, but na north is at the top here. We'll talk later about how that came to be. Um, that means that over here uh, is the east. That island up at the top there is Japan um, and the Pacific. Then this is a kind of made-up concoction of India and China based on the writings of Marco Polo and other travelers. Uh, Central Asia, the Middle East, uh, the Mediterranean, Europe, Africa, 
And then over here is the most famous part of the map. Uh, it's depiction of the New World. Um, <clears throat> this is North America up here. Uh, this is probably Florida there and the Gulf of Mexico there. Uh, this, these are the, the big islands of the Caribbean and the little islands of the Caribbean. And then this giant southern landmass is what we'd call South America today. And it's actually South America that the makers of this map coined the name America for. North America is kind of uh, an irrelevance at this point. Uh, the name America appears down here on what we would probably call Brazil today. There's a close-up of it. Uh, that is the first use of the name America. Uh, it's kind of cool to have the document that actually first um, introduced everybody to the name. Um, until 2003, I really didn't know anything about this map. I wasn't even much of uh, a geography or cartography buff. Uh, at the time, I was an editor and writer at the Atlantic Monthly, and across my desk one day came a press release announcing that the Library of Congress, uh, for the sum of $10 million, uh, had bought what it called the sole surviving copy of America's birth certificate. Um, $10 million was a figure that got my attention. Uh, that, that turned out to be more than the Library of Congress had ever spent on anything, uh, which is saying something. The library has bought a lot of uh, pretty expensive stuff. Uh, turned out to be about $2 million more than had been paid at public auction for an original printed copy of the Declaration of Independence not long before. Um, just got me thinking. Well, how was it that I didn't know anything about this thing that seemed to be the jewel of the Library of Congress's collection uh, and that seemed to be um, at open market apparently worth more than an original printed copy of the Declaration of Independence. So I asked friends and colleagues if they could tell me anything about the map, and nobody could. Uh, so I thought, being a magazine person, that I'd write a little article about it. And that was the delusional beginning of what became a monster. <laughs> um, I did a little bit of looking into the story and was pretty quickly able to find out the basics of the story, which I'll lay out for you here. You, some of you may already know it, but um, I hope you'll bear with me if you do. Um, Everybody knows Columbus crossed the Atlantic in 1492 and found land on the other side. Uh, but in 1506, he died still believing that what he'd found was a part of Asia. In fact, he believed what he found was a part of Asia that was on maps of the time already. So in a way, although it was revolutionary um, that he had sailed across the Atlantic, uh, he believed that he had confirmed an old vision of the world, that he wasn't actually adding to people's understanding of the globe except by joining the two pieces that hadn't been joined before. Um, <clears throat> even a decade after his death, you still see maps identifying uh, the New World as Asia. This is a close-up of North America on a map from 1516. Uh, this is North America here. Here's Florida, the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see on the mainland, it's labeled a little confusedly, land of Cuba, part of Asia. Um, so, and, and <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the western edge of North America isn't defined. It just runs into the border of the map. So you know, obviously they don't know everything about it, but they've decided that this is Asia. This edge of the map would naturally bleed into the far uh, eastern edge, which is Asia. So um, this was the prevailing view in the early days of discovery. And it wasn't just Columbus. Uh, another of his colleagues, Amerigo Vespucci, uh, whose portrait appears here at the top of the Waldseemuller map, um, in the end of the 1490s and beginning of the 1500s, made a series of voyages across the Atlantic also. Uh, but what Vespucci did was uh, cross the Atlantic and uh, arrive in the Caribbean region, just like Columbus. But then he, instead of staying there, uh, decided he was going to turn left and go south. Uh, and then he followed the coastline of what we now know of as South America for thousands of miles, uh, below the equator and well into the southern hemisphere, into a part of the world uh, that people assumed didn't have land in it, certainly didn't have inhabited land in it. Uh, and in effect, what he'd done was sail off maps of the time. Uh, and that, uh, the southness of this continent that he was exploring, was what made a big impression on early Europeans in the, in the initial phase of the age of discovery. That doesn't mean that he believed he was uh, discovering new, a new continent. Um, he, Vespucci repeatedly called what he was uh, exploring Asia, an endless Asian land, he said at one point. Um, but it made a big impression, and a bigger impression than Columbus in a way, because nobody could find this place on a map. Um, when Vespucci got home, he wrote letters uh, back to friends and family in Florence, um, and <coughs> publishers there got their hands on some of his letters. And they did what publishers always do. They, want, they said it wasn't quite sensational enough, and they themselves um, spiced it up with some stories of sex and cannibalism and adventure on the high seas. Uh, and they published one letter in particular under the title Mundus Novus, Latin for New World. 
Uh, and that letter became uh, an early bestseller in Europe. Um, this these were the early days of the printing press. All of a sudden, you've got this ability to rapidly uh, disseminate information in a way that hadn't been possible previously. So everybody starts to see these, uh, these letters of Vespucci describing the discovery of a new world. The phrase new world, though, didn't mean uh, then what we think it means now. It didn't mean a new continent. Vespucci always believed he was exploring a part of, the new, a, a part of Asia. Um, new world just meant a part of the world that Europeans hadn't previously visited before. At about this time, they were also describing parts of southern Africa as a new world. Um, so forget this idea that when Vespucci wrote letters and this, this, this tract titled New World was published, that he was announcing a new continent. Vespucci's letters, like I said, spread rapidly around Europe, as did some of the early sailors' charts showing the coastlines of the New World, and they made their way to, among other places, uh, a little town uh, in the mountains of eastern France called saint dié uh, not far from Strasbourg, uh, in what today is Lorraine. Uh, and there, in that town, was a small group of uh, scholars and printers who, at the time, were uh, engaged in making a world atlas. Uh, among them was the mapmaker Martin Waldsimmler, whose name would ultimately be attached to this map. And they decided, for reasons that are obscure to us today, uh, that what they were seeing on these sailors' charts and that what Vespucci was describing in his letters and that what Columbus was describing, for that matter, uh, wasn't a part of Asia uh, and that it had to be actually uh, a new continent. It wasn't one of the three known parts of the world, Europe, Asia, and Africa. It was something different. It was a fourth part of the world, hence the title of my book. Um, and because they read it about it in Vespucci's letters, and Vespucci seemed to be, from the European perspective, the discoverer of it, uh, they decided to name it in his honor, hence America. So that's the, the, the basic story, um, but there's more to it than that, because it turns out that they printed 1,000 copies of this map. Um, a big world map like this, before the age of printing, was almost impossible to reproduce and disseminate rapidly. All of a sudden now, in the age of printing, you have the ability to take a map like this, run off lots of copies, and have it reappear all over Europe, <clears throat> and that's what seems to have happened. In the years immediately after 1507, you start to see references to it, sketches of it in primarily university towns in Europe, um, and by the middle of the century, the name America has caught on. Um, it, it filled a vacuum. It arrived at the right time. It was a kind of poetic counterpoint to Asia, Europe, and Africa, um, and it caught on. Um, <clears throat> it was even used by then, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for North America as well as South America. But the map itself disappeared. Uh, there's a catalog of maps uh, from the 16th century that mentions Martin Waldsimmler and his maps doesn't say anything about this map at all, which is weird because we consider it today a, a national treasure, the map that gave America its name. Um, what happened? Why would it have disappeared? One reason is that this, th this is a wall map. And what would you do to mount a wall map in, in, the, in the early 1500s? You take each of these sheets slather the back of it with glue, and then tack it up onto a linen sheet and hang it in a room in cold Europe where you'd have a nice big fireplace puffing out soot, and the map would rapidly degrade. Um, the other reason that it, the map would have disappeared was just the pace of discovery. Um, there was new information flooding back to Europe in those decades, and this map's depiction of, of the New World in particular would have gone out of date very quickly. So people would have done what uh, they did when the Soviet Union fell, just tear it down, throw it away, and put up a new one. Uh, so this is an ephemeral document, and it might have disappeared altogether from history uh, had it not been for a German scholar named Johannes Schoner, who uh, sometime before 1520 decided he wanted a copy of the map for his own research purposes, had a copy reprinted, uh, and bound it into a folio, uh, which he then uh, kept in his library. After his death, that folio somehow made it to a castle in southern Germany, uh, where it sat uh, in the castle library for hundreds of years, basically forgotten. Uh, until 1901, when this guy, Father Joseph Fisher, who was a teacher of geography and an expert in the cartography of the New World, made a visit to this castle uh, to look at another map. And while he was there, he visited this little annex to the castle library in a tower. Uh, and in that, in that room, on one of the shelves, was this folio. And inside the folio, lo and behold, when he opened it up, he found this pristine copy of the Waldsmuller map. Uh, because he was an expert in the cartography of the New World, he knew right away what he'd found, <clears throat> and he quickly announced his discovery and published a facsimile, and you start to see headlines like this. It was a big deal. 
for a little while. Um, people got very excited. Uh, and naturally, Americans in particular decided, rich Americans decided they wanted to buy it. Um, so you have people making overtures to the prince uh, of the castle uh, trying to buy it, but they couldn't agree on a price. Then came World War I, World War II, and it really wasn't until the end of the 20th century that the Library of Congress managed to uh, get serious negotiations underway to buy the map. Uh, which finally brings us back to 2003 when they issued their press release saying that, that they bought it. Um, so now, having, having learned all of this, I, see, I thought that I probably could do you know, a medium-sized or even big article about the map. Um, but I was busy, so I just stuffed all of my Waldsimilar material in a folder uh, and went on with my life. And it wasn't until 2005 that I came back to it. Um, at the time, the Atlantic Monthly was moved from Boston to Washington. I didn't want to go. I needed to make a living, so I decided I'd try to write a book. And I suddenly had a great idea. I'd go back to this stuff. I'd write the book in 2006 and then publish it in 2007, just in time for the 500th anniversary of the making of the map and the name of America. And I put the book out in 2009. <laughs> um, so it didn't, that, that plan didn't work, but I'm really glad it didn't. Because what happened in the, in the process of my getting into the story was that I realized there's much, much more to this map than just the naming of America. Almost everybody who talks about it limits themselves to the naming of America, maybe the story of the discovery of the New World. But there is way more to the map than just that. Um, on, on, a historic, on, on the level of historical significance, for example, uh, this is the first map to unambiguously show North and South America as surrounded by water. Remember that other depiction of North America that merged the western side with the margin of the map? That's what people typically did. Here you've got <clears throat> the continent surrounded by water for the very first time in 1507. Europeans aren't even supposed to have glimpsed the Pacific until 1513 or sailed around South America until 1520 or so. So something weird's going on here. They, these guys either have uh, really uh, great information that nobody else seems to have uh, had access to, or maybe they made a wild guess. Uh, we can speculate about that later if you want to. But um, this depiction of the New World is something <laughs> really uh, important. Because it's the first map to surround uh, the New World with water, it's also the first map to suggest the existence of the Pacific. That's a pretty cool milestone, too. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, this is one of the very first printed maps ever to show the full coastline uh, of Africa in, a, in an accurate way. Uh, and that, in the context of the times, was probably even bigger news than the depiction of the New World. And that's why Africa breaks the frame of the map here. Uh, they could have made the map just a little bigger and fit Africa in there. They chose not to, and they, they, they did this because they wanted to make a big point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the point was, uh, there's a sea route open now around Africa. For most of the century preceding the making of this map, Europeans had been obsessed with the idea of trying to sail around Africa, <clears throat> make their way from Europe uh, all the way under Africa and over into the Far East, where they could do trade directly with all these people who had, had riches beyond belief, or at least were reported to. Um, they wanted to bypass the overland route through Islamic territories. So this map, in effect, printed, distributed widely, for the very first time, shows uh, the full coastline of Africa and announces there's a sea route open. We can do it. That's really big news. Um, there's an even bigger first, though, I think, and that's what I alluded to earlier. This is one of the very first maps ever to attempt to uh, show the world in a full 360 degrees of longitude. Um, maps prior to this one that were d done using latitude and longitude limited themselves to the known world, Europe, Asia, and Africa. They'd depict that, and they'd give you a little bit of ocean on either side. And that maybe amounted to 270 degrees or so. And then they would just leave implied on the back of the map uh, 90 degrees or so of uncharted oceanic space that um, probably didn't even need to be mapped because it was just water. Uh, so here for the first time you've got the world as a whole kind of spread out and stated um, in kind of incontrovertible, empirical, uh, in an empirical way that you can see the world as a whole now. Uh, and in fact they make a reference up in this little legend to um, how uh, powerful it is to be able to see the world at a single glance. That's a phrase that resonates I think a lot. Um, not only did they make this map and show that, they also made uh, an accompanying little globe uh, these are called globe gores. They're designed to be cut out and then pasted onto a ball. Um, and you can see here that they're also depicting the world in a full 360 degrees. This is the very first mass-produced globe ever made. Um, this is, again, they're taking advantage of, advantage of this new technology, printing, 
and all of a sudden making a globe that for uh, very cheap, you know, the cost of a single piece of paper can be bought um, and then at home assembled. Uh, so there's they're just sort of a cascade of historical first after historical first. Um, <clears throat> but there's more to the map than just that. Uh, as I got into the writing of the book and the more I kind of gazed at this map, I had a copy of it right above my desk, um, the more I realized that it wasn't just a map of one world, it was a map of a lot of different kinds of worlds. It's a map of uh, historical time, it's a map of social forces coming together, and I wanted to try to write a book that actually would uh, recreate that kaleidoscopic effect that I was starting to see in the map. Um, so I came up with a structure that I hoped would do that, and that was to have every chapter of the book open with a little detail of the map. I started over here. Uh, in about the year 1200, uh, at the very edge of what was the, West, the end of the Western world at that time, and then moved first east as Europeans began to move out to Central Asia and meet the Mongols, and then all the way out to China with Marco Polo, and then came back to Europe and go down the coast of Africa, uh, and then eventually come across the Atlantic and over to the New World. The kind of cheesy idea I had in mind that actually made some sense to me was, you know, how some of those Disney cartoons start with a picture of a storybook and there's Prince Charming and he's just on his horse and then the camera zooms in and all of a sudden the horse starts galloping and the story gets underway. Well, I wanted each detail of the map to be like that, a little static picture that then you would then zoom in on and all these stories and ideas would come to life. Um, that approach allowed me to explore this one map in great detail but also to back away a lot um, and give you this kind of big picture sense of all these people crawling all over the world, almost like ants gathering information, going, doing things, and then bringing it all back and having it all be synthesized into this one picture of the world uh, that comes together in 1507. Um, so it's, it's as much the story of this one map as it is this bigger picture story. And I thought we'd now dive in uh, and look at some of the background of the map from the big picture perspective first. Um, title's a good place to start. This is uh, Universal Cosmography. And that title right away signals to people that this isn't just a picture of the world in isolation. It's a picture of the world at the center of the medieval cosmos, which was not the same as the cosmos that we imagine today. Uh, in the Middle Ages, people imagined the cosmos in the way that it had been imagined since antiquity. And in effect, it was a set of concentric spheres. You had the Earth at the center, which was stationary. And then you had this ever-widening set of spheres around it. There were the material elements first. Uh, Earth was the heaviest, so everything collapsed in on the Earth. Uh, then there was water, which was the ocean wrapping the, wrapping the Earth. And then after that, there was a sphere of air enveloping everything. Then they surmised that there must be a sphere of fire, because fire, when you lit it, it rose up. It was lighter than air. Then you had all of the spheres of the planets, the sphere of the moon, the sphere of the sun, the planets, and then ultimately one giant sphere at the top, um, or at the outside circumference, uh, wheeling around, holding all of the stars. And the different motions of all these spheres created the motions of the heavens. Uh, it's actually not a bad way of uh, guessing about the motions of the heavens if you assume that the Earth is still. Uh, the Earth at the center of things often was uh, broken up into these three parts. Uh, this is what's called a TO diagram. You see it in countless medieval uh, texts. Uh, <clears throat> and the TO name, I think, is pretty obvious. You've got the O, which is the ocean surrounding the known world. Uh, and then you've got this T in the middle. And the, the T actually represents bodies of water as well. Uh, this T, the stem of the T, is the Mediterranean separating Europe from Africa. And then these two uh, top parts of the T are rivers separating Asia from Africa and Asia from Europe. Um, <clears throat> east is at the top. So here we've got one kind of mapping tradition in which north is not um, at the top. In the, in the Middle Ages, and particularly in Christian Europe, uh, east was at the top of a lot of maps. And there are a lot of good reasons for people to assume that that's the right way to map. Um, East is where the sun rises, so that seems to be where time begins. Uh, east is also where, in the biblical tradition, um, the Garden of Eden is planted on Earth and human history begins. Uh, Asia is the biggest continent. So you have all of these reasons uh, that made East seem like an enduring, powerful thing to put at the top of the map. That legacy still survives today. You know, When you talk about orienting yourself, what you're doing is you're saying, you've got to get East at the top, and then we can figure it all out. Um, when people began to study these maps um, more recently in the 19th and 20th centuries, they, a lot of them decided that, oh, you know, people must have understood that the world was flat because this map makes the world look flat. Uh, forget that. That's, that's a myth um, 
that just doesn't seem to die. Uh, Washington Irving actually helped peddle it in a biography of Columbus in the, in the 1820s. Um, but there was evidence dating way back to antiquity that people always knew the world was round. Um, you've got lots of ancient authors conjecturing about the circumference of the Earth, circumference, um, and getting it pretty close to right. Uh, you've got coins showing the Earth as a globe. This is the Emperor Augustus before, you know, a couple of decades BC, uh, showing his uh, global empire uh, clearly as a globe. You've got medieval texts that had very simple proofs, even for lay people, that the world is round. This one demonstrates that if you're on a boat, if you're on the top of a mast, you, you can see land approaching before you can see it on the deck of the ship. That's because of the curvature of the Earth. That's what this is designed to prove this comes from a book called The Sphere. So everybody knew the world was round. Just forget the world is flat stuff, <laughs> even when it comes to the Columbus story. Columbus knew the world was round. Everybody else knew the world was round. That's not why they mocked him. Um, they mocked him because his ideas of sailing from Europe to Asia were so implausible, as we all know now. It's impl if, if he hadn't bumped into the New World, he would have disappeared forever. Uh, so the people who laughed at him were right. Um, this. Uh, conventional three-part world uh, that you see again and again um, <coughs> was used in religious texts, it was used in geographical texts, it was used in encyclopedias. Uh, it was a kind of scholarly theological diagram of the world. Uh, there were variations on the theme, and I'll just spend a minute on one of them. Uh, this is also a TO map. You can see this top circle, this is Asia, Europe and Africa, surrounded by the sphere of the ocean, but then on the other side of the ocean down here in the west, remember east is at the top, uh, is this weird semicircle. This map dates from about the 10th century. Um, what, what the semicircle is, is a hypothetical fourth part of the world. Uh, I'm not showing you this to say that Europeans had definitive knowledge of the Americas at this point, just to show you that um, there was a strong tradition in the Middle Ages dating back to antiquity uh, of speculating about the existence of some great landmass across the ocean. Um, to the west of the known world. Uh, and here you can see it in, in visual form. It's a, it's a funny scheme to look at if you haven't looked at these before, but if you rotate it, you can actually start to see the world as we know it coming into focus. You've got Asia over on the right, Europe and Africa in the middle, and then across what we would call the Atlantic today, you've got this fourth part of the world. Um, so keep that in mind as we travel toward the Waldseemuller map because it's a scheme that's obviously going to come into play. Um, these TO maps, uh, really were everywhere, and by the time um, the 1200s or so arrive, when the book starts, you, you see them being used in lots of symbolic ways. You see them, for example, uh, in form like this. This is Christ crucified on top of a TO map, and the symbolism's great. You know, now the T that's in the middle of the map isn't just symbolizing bodies of water that keep the parts of the world apart. It's now symbolizing the cross that allows Christ to bring the whole world together. Uh, you see political symbolism as well. Uh, this is a, a, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I, who's in that kind of standard European pose of a, a ruler holding a globe and scepter, and again, he's holding a globe. Um, and that globe, if you look carefully, is divided up just like a TO map, uh, labeled Asia, Europe, and Africa. And that symbolism is pretty great, too. He's saying, you know, I'm a ruler. I'm, I'm going to extend my reach right around the whole world, and I can have the world in my hand. Um, Political and religious symbolism of this sort come together in the 1200s in a series of really cool, very elaborate and symbolic uh, medieval maps of the world, often called Mappai Mundi, Latin for maps of the world. Um, <clears throat> this is a good representative example, and we could talk about this map alone for an hour, and obviously we can't. So I'm just going to zero in on a couple of things about it that pertain to the Waldseemuller map. Um, at the top, in the east, you've got this figure of Christ, a kind of divine representative who is um, gazing down at the world. He's the only figure, this map is telling you as a, as a lowly, earthbound Christian, uh, who can see the world as a whole. Um, the divine mind is the only one that can comprehend all of creation, that can comprehend uh, not only space but time. Um, he, in, his right, in his left hand, he's got a TO globe. I don't know how you can see that, but it's there. And once you start seeing these things, you look at cathedral windows, you see them, they're everywhere. Um, he's, he's hovering right above the rising sun. This is the east, remember. Uh, here's the sphere of water. Um, right below the rising sun is a little cute uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So human history is beginning in the east as well. Uh, the geography, the, the scheme that we're looking at on this map is basically a TO map. Uh, the green 
at the outside of the circle is the ocean surrounding the known world. Then Asia is at the top here, Europe and Africa separated by this T of water. Um, so it's a basic TO map that's then been elaborated uh, pretty radically. Uh, and what this map really is, is a, a map of history as much as it is of time. Uh, this, is, this is the story of human history, particularly Christian human history, uh, kind of projected onto a geographical backdrop. Uh, and that's an important distinction to make because um, maps in the Middle Ages sometimes were called histories. And in fact, histories, text, history texts were sometimes called maps. Uh, the boundaries between what was a map and what was a history weren't nearly as distinct as they are today. This map is operating on a couple of different levels. And that's something that we've lost in modern mapping in a lot of ways, again, until you guys have started playing with it, is this idea that maps can, can show you more than just geography. Uh, that's why this kind of map is so interesting. Um, but the, as a practical guide to geography, it's, it's not useful. If you squint at it hard, you can start to make out the parts of the world. You know, here's Asia up here. This is Italy, a little peninsula. Um, but it's not, it, it's hard to do. Uh, however, at the time this kind of map was being made, um, another entirely different mapping tradition was coming into its own, uh, made by sailors, sailors' charts, uh, which arrive on the scene in about the 1100s. Um, and it's kind of amazing when you've been looking at medieval maps like these made by scholars and monks, and then you start looking at sailor's charts, it's like you just put on a pair of glasses. Suddenly the world snaps into focus, uh, and you recognize everything. This isn't a chart that sailors would have used. This is an ornamental copy, but I've chosen it because it gives you a very good sense of what sailor's charts did. Um, uh, the first thing is that it shows the Mediterranean basin. These maps were made by uh, European sailors who wanted to make their way around the, the Mediterranean and uh, out into the Atlantic a bit, and then even down uh, the African coastline just a bit. Um, they're crisscrossed with these lines, uh, loxodromes, or rum lines they're called. Uh, and the idea was that if you wanted to get from, let's say, up here in Italy down to North Africa, you'd find the line that best uh, corresponded uh, um, to the course you wanted to sail. Then you'd drag it over here with your compass dividers to the compass rows. Uh, and then with the help of a compass, was an, which was another new technology at the time, you could sail across open water, even if you couldn't see the stars. So that led to the ability to sail more quickly from place to place. You didn't have to hug the shoreline. Um, shorelines, though, are the other feature that's very characteristic of these maps. Sailors didn't care about anything except uh, the coastlines. All of this stuff here uh, w was, this is, these are um, ornamental pictures that are drawn for whoever the recipient of this map was. And I should just pause and say that this map, although it looks like it's oriented with north at the top, actually isn't. You'd think so because of all these people down here, but if you have a look at this little guy up here, uh, he's completely upside down. That's because these maps were made to be rotated and point them at, in the direction that you want to go. Um, so again, here's a second kind of mapping tradition that doesn't have north as a natural top. Um, if you look at a real sailor's chart, you can get a better sense of what was important. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is the exact same region that we were looking at, that last map. Uh, here's Italy in the form of a boot. Follow the coastline over here. Here's uh, what, what would be today be Lebanon, Palestine, North Africa, all the way over. All of this is the Mediterranean. All you can see is coastlines. If you look carefully at Italy, you can see better what I'm talking about. Very typical of sailors' charts is that they have these place names just pressed together perpendicular to the coastline, and they define the coastline in a way that's very accurate and unlike what you see on the medieval map by Mundi. Um, it's only with the arrival of sailors' charts that you start to have people describing Italy as a boot. Before that, uh, Europeans in, in the literature usually described it as an oak leaf. Um, people knew it was a kind of vague peninsula shape, but it's only the arrival of um, the sailors' chart that makes people see the world differently. And that leads to people um, sort of riffing on it. One of the very first people to talk about Italy as a boot was the poet Petrarch in the, in the um, 1300s. And what he says is, after having looked at sailors' charts, he knew them well, uh, he says, oh, Italy, I can see you. You're, you're like a boot with your heel about to crush those Greeklings. He didn't like the, the Eastern Christians and the Greeks. So now the ability to see the world differently gives you a feeling of power, gives you a feeling of visualizing and, in fact, controlling the world. And that's a theme, obviously, that runs through the whole history of cartography. Um, it was an appealing way of looking at the world, and that's why you get these ornamental copies uh, pretty quickly that are made 
not for sailors, but for kings and noblemen and wealthy merchants uh, who just want to gaze at this expanded and uh, newly accurate vision of the world. Um, the problem with sailors' charts, though, is that they're all based on just point-to-point -point observation. You know, you're over here, you want to take a sighting of over there, you sketch in what you're doing. Um, doesn't take into account the curvature of the Earth. It's fine for the Mediterranean, which only occupies a small portion of the globe, um, but when it comes to sailing across large bodies of ocean, of ocean or mapping a much larger portion of the globe, you get more and more distortion and they become less and less useful. At the time that this map was made, though, you get a third independent strand of uh, mapping tradition that returns to Europe after a long absence. And these are the maps of Ptolemy, the ancient Greek sage, uh, who in the second century had written a book called The Geography. Uh, and in The Geography, Ptolemy, in, in effect, uh, laid out the, the kind of mapping that we do or know best today, latitude and longitude. Uh, and he uh, also described how you could construct three mathematical grids and projections onto which you could plot coordinates and take into account the curvature of the Earth. Uh, this portrait of Ptolemy also appears on the top of the Waldseemuller map. Um, the basic idea, <laughs> as it was presented in, in um, texts of the time, was that you would take sightings of the stars, in particular the pole star, and that would give you your latitude. Your latitude is just the, the angular height of the pole star. Um, you'd estimate distances east-west. You'd do a little bit of um, fancy astronomy if you thought you were good at it. Um, longitude was obviously really hard to predict at that point uh, and, and determine accurately, but people tried. And then you'd take your lines of latitude and longitude uh, and you would cross them, as this helpful little picture shows you, uh, and that would give you a, a coordinate, a place on the map. Uh, once you had coordinates, you could choose one of Ptolemy's map projections and plot all your points on the map projection and you'd start to be able to connect the dots. Ptolemy and the geography um, collected about 8,000 coordinates, way more information than anybody had ever gathered uh, before or after. Um, whether he actually made maps along with his text isn't clear. Um, if he did, they were lost. Uh, copyists who copied texts over the centuries were fine at copying words, but they certainly couldn't reproduce images in any kind of reasonable and accurate way, so they were lost. But it didn't matter, because when Ptolemy's geography returned to Europe in about 1400, in effect, people had the information digitized. They had all those coordinates, and, and they could um, plot all those coordinates on one of the grids that Ptolemy taught them how to construct, connect the dots, uh, color in the, the, the whole thing, and almost like magic, you'd have a vision of the ancient world reassembled for you before your eyes. Um, this vision of the world, which has Europe up here, North Africa here, and Asia here, uh, was hugely... Uh, important and uh, influential in the 1400s in Europe. This was the beginning of the Renaissance, and the, the whole engine of the Renaissance was the reviving of the ancient world. And here you've got, in one fell swoop, a visualization of that process. Here's the ancient world, like magic, after it's been lost. Um, early scholars were particularly excited because they were puzzling their way through all sorts of texts with all these strange place names that were lost. You know, Caesar's Campaigns of Gaul He's mentioning all these places that nobody knows about, <clears throat> how, how they correspond to modern places. Well, all of a sudden, here you've got um, a world map and then a bunch of regional maps that went along with this that give you all those place names. So now people can actually um, work on reassembling uh, knowledge of the ancient world and understanding ancient texts. By the middle of the 1400s, though, uh, people began to realize that Ptolemy had given them not just a vision of the past, but also a way of... Uh, seeing the future, and a very powerful tool. Um, they could, um, using Ptolemy and using mathematics, uh, start to do what on medieval maps um, they, were, they had been told only God could do. That is, kind of back away uh, and see the world as a whole. Uh, Ptolemy mapped about 180 degrees. He started over here in the Canary Islands at the zero degree point uh, and ended at 180 degrees over here. So the vision, the field of vision has radically expanded, and you start to have people feeling that maybe it's possible for any earthbound human to see the world as a whole, in effect to do this, um, to take the globe as a whole, look at it from a distance like only God had been able to do previously, and start to render it on a flat piece of paper. Um, it was a very powerful idea, and you start to see people kind of waxing uh, very philo philosophical about it in the, in the second half of the 15th century. Uh, you see, and you also see references um, to 
people kind of getting together and gathering just to look at Ptolemy's maps in exactly the way I can say from firsthand experience uh, people have these days gathered around a computer to look at Google Earth. I mean, the, the analog to me is very, very striking. Um, and you see, see statements like this. Um, this great work raises us above the limits of an Earth obscured by clouds, demonstrating how we can circle all or part of the world, pilgrims through the colors of a flat parchment. Substitute, you know, computer for parchment, and you've got the same kind of idea. And you see images like this. All of a sudden, people are now imagining that they can see the world almost from space. Um, this is Ptolemy's map, kind of artistically drawn onto half a globe, which is what, uh, which is the range that he covered. Um, it's, it was a very, very powerful idea. Um, the map shows Europe over here, North Africa here, Asia over here. There are a lot of inaccuracies, and even though these maps were made well into the, the 16th century uh, and beyond, uh, people retained the inaccuracies, um, even though they knew that, for example, North Africa didn't look anything like that, or that uh, Scotland didn't bend uh, to the east like that. That's because people were making Ptolemaic maps just as much as a historical document. They wanted to show you what the ancient world looked like, not what the modern world looked like. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, <clears throat> one of the features of Ptolemy's world that was uh, a big bummer for Europeans was that he showed uh, China coming down and joining Africa under the Indian Ocean. Europeans at this point had been obsessed with sailing around Africa and getting into the Indian Ocean. Well, here Ptolemy is suggesting that you can't do it. Um, big problem. But Ptolemy didn't um, say that he knew what the world looked like, and he, in fact, actively encouraged readers to go out and explore more of the world and revise the picture of the world <clears throat> using his mapping system. And that's what Europeans did in the 15th century in particular. Uh, they decided they'd go back to books by Marco Polo and others, which had been pr read primarily as kind of fairy tales almost. Um, and they concocted a kind of imaginary vision of the Far East based on those. And they bumped the world maybe another 90 degrees out beyond Ptolemy's limit. Uh, and then Europeans, uh, throughout the course of the century, sailed their way all the way down the coast of Africa, well below Ptolemy's limits. Uh, and in 1489, they made their way right to the southern tip. Um, raising hopes that, in fact, they could sail into the European, uh, into the Indian Ocean, hence the name the Cape of Good Hope. Their hope now was alive again. Um, <clears throat> that was 1489, and in 1490, you start to see maps like this one. I don't know how well you can see it. The map itself is very poorly preserved. Can you see it at all? No. That's too bad. Um, well, I'll just skip it, but I'll tell you that um, the map shows a kind of hypothetical version of the Far East. Is that any better? That's a little bit better. Um, so what we're looking at over here is this hypothetical bump of the Far East. Um, Japan is way over at the edge of the map. Here's the Pacific, big spice islands. And then Africa over here comes all the way down, and there is a clear ocean passage showed under Africa. The map is rammed through the frame of the map. The Africa is rammed through the frame of the map, just like on the Baltimore map. The point being is that you can now sail all the way around Africa and into the Indian Ocean. Big news. Can we keep that down for one more second? Because I'm going to show. Thanks. Um, this is 1490. It's only two years before Columbus. So this vision of the world is what Columbus would have known. And you can see, if you can see this map, um, what Columbus would have imagined he was going to do. He had two choices. He could sail all the way around Africa, all the way down here, which had proved to be hugely difficult. He could get to the southern tip. Then he could try uh, to sail into unknown territory, unknown waters into the Indian Ocean, sail for thousands of miles all the way around here and get up to the coast of China, which nobody had ever done and would prove to take years and would be very, very expensive. Or he could just sail from Europe around that implied 90 degrees on the back of the map and make his way over to China. That um, <clears throat> seemed like an easier thing to do. That's what he decided to do. And in fact, when he made his first voyage, he sailed across the ocean, bumped into a big island at about what he calculated to be 90 degrees and then bumped into mainland. So not actually surprising that he concluded he'd reached Asia. That's exactly the vision of the world uh, that he um, had been conditioned to expect to see. Uh, Vespucci also believed he was sailing um, along the coastline of South America, uh, of um, Asia as well. I'm sorry, could I ask somebody to turn that down just for one more second? <laughs> Again, 
I don't know if we can see it, but you can see this big peninsula here. Vespucci believed he bumped into this about here and that he would follow it south and then it would take this big turn to the west and then he would sail around it and into the Indian Ocean. He actually refers to getting to this part and he uses colonies mapping terms to describe it. Um, but what happened, uh, when, you, when you look at the sailor's charts that dates from the time of Vespucci's voyages, this is one of the earliest New World sailing charts to survive, is that Vespucci sailed, bumped into the New World over here, started sailing south, expecting that it would take a turn to the west and take him into the Indian Ocean, but it kept going and going and going below the tip of Africa, and clearly, by the time he got down here, it hadn't ended yet. So this was not Asia as it appeared on maps, which is why he described it as a new world. This is something uh, that Europeans hadn't known about. Asia, I guess, goes down to the south like this. Um, it was a chart like this, along with Vespucci's letters, uh, that eventually made its way to uh, saint dié de vosges in France, which is kind of like a proto-mountain view. <laughs> um, this is where Martin Waldsimmler and his colleagues were working on a world atlas, a Ptolemy atlas at the time, and they decided uh, that they were going to halt the work on their atlas and that they were going to announce that uh, what Vespucci had been sailing along was a new world. They were going to produce a map of the whole world. Uh, <clears throat> we know their story because they also, in addition to the big map and that little globe, published a book called The Introduction to Cosmography. And in that book, uh, they announced, um, first of all, they described the cosmos as we've talked about it today. Then they described the three parts of the known world as we've talked about today. And then they dropped a little bombshell. They announced these parts, Europe, Asia, and Africa, have now been more widely explored, and a fourth part has been discovered by Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, I don't see why anyone should rightly prevent this new part from being called America. So there you have it, a, an explanation of the naming of America, which is pretty cool, because obviously the other continents, nobody has any idea how those names came about. Here it's being named after somebody uh, in living memory who in fact was alive at the time and who had no idea that it was being done. Um, but that was sort of the minor event compared to the big map, and I thought we'd just wrap up by um, zooming over this map and exploring the, the ways in which the many traditions we've talked about tonight, today, all come together in this one map. Um, we could start with the center of the map. Uh, <coughs> it's Ptolemy, and in, in particular, it's based on this edition of Ptolemy. And if you look at the two parts as they correspond, you can see just how close the correspondence is. You, again, you've got North Africa, Europe, the Mediterranean. Same thing over here. Um, Waldseemuller deliberately decided to preserve a picture of the ancient world at the middle of his map. People sometimes criticize the map because it got Africa wrong. Um, that's beside the point. Like some of these medieval maps, this map is as much a history as it is a geography. Waldseemuller on this one map is trying to show you the ancient world. You can imagine in a classroom setting, it would be more useful to have this map tell you where Odysseus went uh, on his voyages or where Caesar was in, in his campaigns in Gaul than some map of the modern world. So remember that this is a map made for educating humanists. Um, when it came to expanding the vision of the world, you can't see it, I guess, but Waldseemuller borrowed from this map um, in his depiction of the Far East uh, and his depiction of part of the African coastline. Um, and we'll just skip over that map because you can't see it. Uh, and then uh, when it came to the full African coastline, he borrowed from sailors' charts. Uh, if you take a close-up of West Africa, you can see actually the point at which he stitches together a sailor's chart uh, and the Ptolemaic version of North Africa. Um, down here on the Waldseemuller map, you can see he's crowded together all of these place, nines, place names and he's got a, a detailed coastline of the sort that you would find on a sailor's chart. Um, up here, though, uh, he, you've got North Africa, as Ptolemy might have mapped it, uh, where the place names clearly haven't been borrowed from a sailor's chart. So you've got the point here where he's stitching these two distinct traditions together. Um, when it comes to the New World, um, the depiction on this sailor's chart is one that he borrowed from. It doesn't look much like the depiction on the Waldseemuller map, but that's because the sailor's chart isn't a map projection. It's not trying to take into account the curvature of the Earth. If you compensate for that and you compare a small part, North America and the islands of the Caribbean, you can see how close the correspondence is. Um, it's clear that he's borrowed from that. Um, this is also, uh, it, has, it has a symbolic dimension. Uh, it's a universal cosmography, as we talked about, and that calls to mind these medieval maps. Um, and Waldseemuller, in particular, plays with this idea of somebody at the top of the map seeing the whole world. Um, in medieval maps, it was God. In the Renaissance, which celebrated the power of the individual, you've got real people 
uh, looking at the world as a whole. This is Ptolemy on the left, and he's representing, symbolizing the learning of the ancients, which, which Europeans are now reviving. Uh, and on the right, you've got Vespucci, symbolizing modern scholars and modern adventurers. Each of them is looking at the part of the world that they map. Ptolemy mapped this part of the ancient world. Modern explorers, after Ptolemy, figured out what um, China uh, looks like, figured out what the new world looked like. For the first time, all of a sudden, you've got uh, two parts of the world that you can piece together with the learning of the ancients and the voyages of the moderns to get a vision of the world that's accessible to anybody, um, to any individual earthbound person. There's also a political dimension that is uh, very seldom talked about, but I think is really cool. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is a German map. It was dedicated to this guy, the Holy Roman Emperor of the German nation. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but in the back, you've got a, one, the imperial double eagle, which looks like this. The double eagle symbolized, among other things, uh, the empire's east and west looking halves. Uh, and the, it, it implied the ambition of the empire to span the globe as a whole. Um, in the early 1500s, you start to see the double eagle used in unusual ways, almost cartographic ways. This is a map that shows you the constituent parts of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, now you can see this figure of Christ, just like on those medieval maps, bringing the world together. Um, you've got the double eagle heads looking east and west. Um, I had the copy of the Baltimore map above my desk the whole time I was working, and I kept on feeling when I looked at it that it was like a giant bird kind of getting ready to take flight. But I never could do anything with that until I came across these double eagle images. And then I realized that maybe implicit in the form of the Baltimore map was this German double eagle. And I think if you look at this and then you start to look at the Baltimore map, you can see how that might be. Um, Ptolemy and Europe are the kind of central beating heart of the map. Uh, the two parts of the world discovered in modern times are the wings as they lift up. And then you've got the two heads looking east-west at the top. That was a nice thing to, oops, I don't know what happened there. Uh, so that's where we were, that's where we were, right? Oh, no, sorry. Anyway, I'll stay there. Um, that's a nice thing to think about, but it seemed like a theory of my own that wasn't really going to be um, anything I could confirm until I came across maps like this, which were produced in the 16th century also after the Baltimore map that actually do map the world in the form of an imperial double eagle. So I think it's safe to say that encoded in this map is a kind of political mention uh, political reference to the idea of the world um, as a German world, uh, not something that people talk about very much, but that has overtones. Um, so, um, altogether, it was a map that really stitched together a lot. Uh, Waltzman and his colleagues took the traditional idea of a three-part world, uh, added this kind of symbolic dimension to it, uh, made the core of their map, Ptolemy, and the ancient world, a kind of historical vision, um, added to that this modern vision of the world that nobody can see, <laughs> um, took information about southern Africa and about the new world from sailors' charts, infused it all with this idea of a political um, empire, um, decided that they could take stock of all that information and see the world in a new way, and then overlaid this all with the idea that maybe the hypothetical fourth part of the world was a real fourth part of the world, and came up with this map uh, that we're all here looking at today. So. Thank you. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to talk about it.